everyone, and welcome to today's program. I'm your host, Jason Attic. If there was a color to describe the state of the financial markets in 2022, the obvious choice would be red. The iShares MSCI All Country World Index ETF, which tracks the performance of the world's major equity markets, tumbled roughly 20% during that time. In fact, just 23 of the 87 global equity indexes around the world were in positive territory as of early September. And it's not just that stocks suffered. Measures of fixed incomes, real estate, and currencies around the world have all generally felt the pain too. So it may be fair to say that it's been tough for many investors to find a winning trade. Of course, that's not to say that it's impossible. For instance, there are individual stocks that have managed to outperform during this market malaise and others that may be poised for rebound once the worst is over. We're going to explore some of the factors that may help you make a more informed investment decision. Here with us to give us his perspective is Peter Hodson, founder and head of research at 5i Research and an independent provider of equity research. Peter has more than 20 years of experience in stock research and investment management. Peter, it's great to have you here. Thanks for taking the time to stop by. Thanks, Jason. It's uh, It's been a tough year, but uh, happy to help out. Yeah, it's it's and good, good to hear one. Maybe not good to hear, but we're all not alone in that market. We're all kind of feeling feeling the pain of the market. But uh, before we kind of jump into our conversation, um, can you tell us maybe about your own investment philosophy? How would you describe yourself as an investor and what kind of approach do you take? Sure. I, I spent about 20 years as an investment manager, a mutual fund manager and a hedge fund manager. Um, and it all during all that time, I was a small cap growth manager. And so that was sort of naturally what I was gravitated towards. I, I get bored with the big companies and I like the small, exciting companies where you can, you know, really, I guess I'm looking for the next, the next big thing. You know, there's some people out there that are uh, growth at a reasonable price and those people, they don't want to pay too much for a growth company, but I don't really like that phrase. I would rather pay more for a great company than, than less for a mediocre, okay company. So I don't mind paying up for growth. Um, and so that's, that's what I've been doing for the past couple of decades. I like to look at management. I like to look at cash flows. I like to look at balance sheets. And if you can get a company that does something different or has a competitive advantage, then that's pretty good too. Um, but I'm not into the, the micro caps. I'm not into the sort of crazy stuff and the thematic stuff. I just really want a company that's doing well, has the capital and has the potential to keep doing well and grow into a large cap. And there's nothing quite like finding a small company and seeing it grow into a large cap company that everyone's heard of. And no one heard of it five years ago. That's just the that's what I'm living for right now. <laughs> you get a bit of thrill of being there first, almost. I can I can Ab- imagine. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's nothing quite like it, especially if you you talk to some investors about it, and you know, five years later, they say, you know, thanks thanks for that one because it did really well. And, you know, that's a great feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another little feather in your cap. So I yeah, <laughs> I can I can definitely appreciate where where you're coming from there. Okay, so first off, there appears to be a lot of hand wringing among investors all over the all over the market here during the downturn of 2022. Uh, many may have been tempted to sell, or, or even may have already sold out of their positions. How do you approach market downturns? Uh, like, like as someone who's been in the industry for over you know for over two decades, how can you uh, kind of relay your experience? Yeah, I guess the, the first thing to do is is tell yourself or remind yourself that it's not the first time. You know, this is not the first time that investors have panicked and you know, I'm getting long in the tooth. I was a broker in 1987, so I know all about panic and I've been through the financial crisis and, and it, they end. The downturns end and a bear market's part of a regular market cycle. The other thing, though, that people have to remember is that you have to put in your time. So there's a lot of investors that you really have to fight the urge to sell. As mm-hmm. things get worse, of course, you get more worried. And they're, you're more likely to sell at the exact wrong time. And this is how a bottom is set in the market where everybody hates everything and they're worried about everything. So nobody wants to buy anything. There's only sellers out there. So just keep in mind that there's a time frame and this will end. The market is not going to zero. Businesses are still making money today, um, but you have to put in the time. And it's important to make sure your companies that you're buying are going to be around when things turn around. And this is where you want to stick with some quality um, you know, I don't know how long this is going to last. It may last another week or it could last another four years. You got to mm-hmm. make sure your company's around at the end of the day to enjoy the the, uh, the up cycle. And just with the heady days of the like the 2010s, it is maybe difficult for people to remember there are cycles to the market, right? We're always not going to be in a boom kind of situation, right? So there's obviously no shortage of pessimistic headlines. And that's true during the market uh, downturns as well as everything going on in the world. 
um, during these turbulent economic conditions. Why do you largely ignore kind of the doom and gloom narratives that are out there? A couple of reasons. So, so one is the, the people that are negative, the, the people are saying, oh, it's going to get worse. They do not have a better track record of predictions than someone who says it's going to get better. But what happens in, in a bear market, they get way more publicity. So you hear more about the doom and gloom people than you do about the, I don't think there's any optimistic people out there right now, but their, their forecasting ability is not any better than mine, which means I don't know what's going to happen. And you have to admit to yourself that no one knows what's going to happen in the, in the big picture in terms of what's going to happen in the world and interest rates, inflation. So one of the reasons I like to ignore that stuff is you have to get back to the company fundamentals. You're not buying inflation. You're not buying interest rates. You're not buying you know, the GDP of Europe. You're buying an actual company. And how is that company doing? And you know, I don't want to say I like bear markets, but in a bear market, everything goes down. The, the great companies go down, the mediocre companies go down, and the bad companies go down. So you can get great companies at much cheaper valuations but you have to focus on the company itself. If you, if you looked at the headlines, you, you would never buy anything ever because there's always a reason not to buy. Um, so I really, you know, this has been a tough market for us because we like to look at companies and right now they don't matter so much, um, but they will. The, the fundamentals will, will rule out in the end. And if you just, just realize that everything's on sale, good, bad, and ugly, and you just mm -hmm. try and pick the good ones. <laughs> okay, so let's shift gears to a little bit around maybe investor sentiment, maybe a little bit about, about investor emotion. Um, some people might be hesitant to invest substantial sums of money when the markets are so rocky and volatile. Uh, what approach do you personally take to pounce on opportunities that can emerge within a down market? So you have to come in with your eyes open and say, things could get worse. And I'm okay with that if they get worse. So the easiest way to do that is to do a, a dollar cost average where you do a, a fixed amount of money weekly or monthly. And there's, there's a couple of reasons that that works out. A, you will get a good average price if you're always buying. Say you, say you split up your money over six months and you do once a month for six months. Your average price over that six months will not be the high. Just mathematically, you're not going to buy at the peak in that situation. Mm -hmm. So your average price will be good. But what we really, really like about dollar cost averaging is it changes the perception of an investor because suddenly if you've got money to deploy each month, you don't really care so much if the market's down. So now the market's going down is a good thing for you and it's not a reason to panic. It's like, oh, I've got my thousand dollars going in this month. That's awesome because I'm getting better prices and it really changes changes people's perception, perceptions and it sort of shifts them into long-term thinking and it gets them into the the belief again that markets go up and down and they won't be able to know you know what's going to happen but as long as you're deploying capital into a bad market you're going to be okay eventually again time frame's important anyone with you know a 6 month who wants to buy a house in 6 months shouldn't be shouldn't be in the equity market I like how you put that. It gets us out of that instant gratification kind of frame of mm -hmm. mind. It gets you Absolutely. thinking kind of, uh, you know, months, years down the road, right? Yeah. All right. So we've established that a big picture mindset might help investors prosper through a market downturn. Now let's explore some of the factors you consider that may indicate a stock is poised for a strong rebound. Along the way, we'll examine an example company to help illustrate the picture here for us. The first is continued earnings growth through market turbulence. Why could this be an important clue? Yeah, so this goes back to the, the fundamentals of the company versus what's happening in the economy or the market. So it, maybe your stock price is down, but it maybe your earnings are up. And so we, we love when there's a disconnect between the value of the company and the earnings and the revenue growth. So if you can take a look at consistent earnings growth over a period of time, then you know it's just a matter of time that that'll get recognized. Right now, it's not getting recognized, but if a company is growing it will get noticed when everyone decides that the bear market's over and they're more confident. So that's, that's really important because if you look at the stock price on some growth companies, some of these companies may be down 50 or 60%, and you might look at it and say, well, that must be a horrible company. But if you take it back down to the basics, it's like, well, let's take a look at it. It, it made more money this year than it did last year, and it made more money last year than it did the prior year. So now they have more money than they did two years ago and the stock price is much, much cheaper. So take it down to the basics, um, look at what they've done in terms of cash flow, and look at in terms of what their valuation is versus what they've actually done. And, and this is where bear markets are, are really, really good because 
there are plenty of companies out there that are still growing 20, 30, 40, 50%, but you would never know it if you looked at their stock price. You would think that it was like the worst company ever, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, I got to dig a little deeper, right, than just yeah. the share price. Absolutely. So, Peter, what does the example company's performance during the 2008 financial crisis and the 2020 pandemic crash suggest to you about how it might fare during an extended downturn? One reason we like to look at um, the 2008 financial crisis, because that was that was the second worst period in the, the financial world other than the Great Depression. You, if you say, OK, if that's as bad as it's going to get, how did that company fare during that period? Now, again, we can't predict the future. We don't know if it's going to get worse than that, but that's a good reference point because it was pretty bad. It was pretty darn bad. And same thing in the, in the pandemic where um, it, the world completely shut down. So looking at um, revenue and earnings, if you can see some sort of consistent pattern in terms of growing revenue throughout those periods, then it's like, okay, now I'm prepared for what may happen. I'm prepared for this company to withstand the next recession or the next downturn. And I'm okay with it because they survived the other one and they kept growing and they kept their cash flow and they kept their earnings. And uh, so that's great. And some, some companies that you're looking at, they will have a dip. You know, they're, you know, no one's, no one's a perfect company and they might have a dip in earnings, but if it's a one year dip because of a recession, then that's okay. If they get back on their trend line, then you're, you're back on growth. And so that's, that's really important because again, it frames you to be prepared for what might happen. So a lot of this is preparation kind of before you get into the trade and kind of getting Absolutely. in the right, the right mindset to, uh, exactly. to, to handle what the potential situation. The second factor that you highlight is a low price to earnings or PE ratio during a market uh, downturn uh, compared to historical average. What might this metric suggest to you about a company's potential to bounce back from the downturn? Yeah, so generally what, what you're looking for is a, um, a premium valuation that has changed but the fundamentals haven't changed as much. So now there are some reasons for a lower price earnings multiple. And one of them is higher interest rates. It's what the market's dealing with these days. Higher inflation is another one. But then it goes back to, okay, well, what happens when the economy shifts or when the market shifts, will that valuation change and how much can it change? And so if you've got a PE multiple of 20, it may not go back to 40 because we, we don't know what's going to happen, but maybe it goes to 30. So that's a pretty big boost if that changes. And if you overlay that with some growth of the company, so as we were looking at the earnings growth of the company, so if they can grow their earnings and their multiple changes, then you can do very, very well with a higher multiple on a higher base of earnings. And so this is where the, the prior multiple comes into play. But you have to be careful because there's, you know, some of the thematic stocks in hot sectors, they might have really, really high multiples, which may not come back. And so we're talking about companies with, you know, solid earnings and a solid history where you can look at that valuation multiple over a period of you know, preferably 15 to 20 years and say, okay, it's never been this cheap before. So how cheap can it get? And then again, you set your base level, things could get worse. And then you said, put on your rose colored glasses and say, well, if things get better, how much more could that valuation change? And if it's a growing company, that could change quite a lot once the sentiment shifts in the market. So we, we call it the double double. So ideally, what I would like to see is a company that can double their earnings and double their multiple. So if you get that, you're going to make four times your money. And I'm willing to wait a very long time to get four times my money. Um, and most recessions are less than two years. So that's, that's where there's opportunity to, to just sit back and wait for things to change. And it's very, very hard for investors to do nothing. But sometimes it's the, the best thing to do. Okay, let's shift back to our example company. Uh, what does the P ratio suggest to you about its current valuation relative to its historic norms? So I guess basically um, what I, I would suggest is that investors are treating it like everything else. They're treating it as, okay, everything's going down. Everything's worth less than it was before on a valuation basis. But looking at the, the other fundamentals on the earnings growth and what they've done, that it's not, you know, it's not a normal average company. It's done a very, very good job for a very, very long time. So perhaps it shouldn't be grouped in with the rest of the market. So it's gone from a, 
a premium valuation to almost a market valuation. So now you've got what to me looks like an above average company trading at a market valuation. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm all over that because again, when you have to make the assumption that a great company is not going to become a horrible company tomorrow. I mean, you have to buy into the fact that it's going to stay great. Um, but if it does stay great and continues to grow, then that valuation will change. It will become more valuable than the market average and perhaps significantly more so depending on you know what the world does and what the company does. So that's that's your opportunity is look for look for greatness that's priced average. Okay, so now I wanted to take a quick pause so we could put some of that uh, great theory into practice so I could show our audience how they can review a company's performance during past uh, downturns in WebBroker. We'll start by choosing uh, the Charts tab here so we can get a, uh, a look back at the historical performance of the company's share price. We get the opportunity to look back at you know, maybe some recent past as well as some uh, a little bit more distant events in the company's history. We have the opportunity to scroll back in on the chart here. We get to see how the company's share price uh, was affected by maybe a recent event in our in our history here. We can see, you know, in early 2020, we can see how the company's share price was depressed by the pandemic crash uh, when COVID hit the world and the world's economies were shutting down. We also have the opportunity to look back, uh, you know, many, many years into the past as well. Let's go ahead and choose 20 years. We can look back at other major financial events. Let's kind of scroll in here to the 2007, 2008 range. We get an opportunity to review how the company's share prices were reacting to the global financial crisis and looking for uh, trends that we might help us predict, uh, you know, the next movement of the company's share price. Another cool tool within web brokers the opportunity to compare your company we have an opportunity to either compare it to and maybe one of its peers in its industry or you have the opportunity to compare it to an index that is uh, that is appropriate in this case i'll go ahead and, and add the s p 500 index right to our chart and we now get the opportunity to track to see how our company is doing versus that index uh, at a given point in time and throughout a longer period of time as well Okay, so beyond reviewing the charts for the share price events, you do also have the opportunity to dig in and look at the company's fundamental data by choosing the fundamentals tab at the top of the page. Here, by going into financial statements, we get access to reviewing the company's income statements, their balance sheet, as well as its cash flow statements. Just focusing here on the income statement, we have the opportunity to look back at the past five years to identify trends. In this case, we can see a, a bar chart of clearly increasing revenue, and we do get an opportunity to kind of dive a little bit further and deeper behind the curtain to really see some of those financial data. And you can dive into any column or any sheet that would be appropriate for your particular analysis. All right, the third factor is how much the company's shares outstanding have grown and at what price it, was, it last issued new shares. What might this say about the health of the business? You want to make sure when a company is issuing stock that they're doing something good with the money, whether they're making an acquisition or they're developing new products that can increase future revenue and cash flow. It's got to be sort of a worthwhile endeavor. Otherwise, why raise the money at all? You want to avoid companies that use their stock like an ATM, where they're every six months they issue stock and they don't really care. It's just they put out millions and millions of shares and dilute all their shareholders. So you watch out for that. But I also like to watch for companies that are generating true shareholder value. And so if you raised money at $10 a couple of years ago, and now you're raising money at $15, I'm okay with that because everybody who financed you before has made money. And you've done a good job with that capital, so we can support you at the $15 level and see what you do. And then maybe your next capital raise will be at 20 or 30. And I, I like that because if you take an example, say a company needs $10 million to do whatever it is they're going to do. If their stock price is a dollar, they're going to have to sell 10 million shares. And you're going to be diluted by 10 million shares as a shareholder. If their stock price is $10. They don't have to sell as many shares. They have to sell 1 million shares. So suddenly your ownership position in that company doesn't change as much. And so that's really what, what we're looking for there. Um, and we're in a situation now with the market where companies are flush with cash, 
and they're generating free cash flow and their stock prices are down. And so many, many companies are buying back stock. So as an owner of the company, as they buy back stock, your ownership position in that company increases. And now you get to share in more of the profits of that company. And then we, we think that's great, um, especially when prices are on sale, at least the company believes they're on sale or they wouldn't be buying them back. All right, so just like with PE, it's, uh, it's, there's more to the story than just share ish issuance. You need to kind of look, dig a little deeper and see, uh, see how the company itself is doing. Um, exactly. But let's, let's focus back on the example companies, share issuance trends. Uh, is there anything here that might inspire confidence or doubt from what you're seeing? Sure, it's just uh, confidence just from a consistent decline over the past multiple years in the number of shares. And so here's a company that has excess cash, is willing to buy back their stock and cancel it. And you've got a situation where now they have less shares outstanding than they did five or six years ago. And you as a shareholder have a bigger piece of the pie. And in some sectors, companies um, right now in certain sectors, they could buy back their entire share float in four or five years and go completely private. Mm. And you know that's the type of scenario where we, we like to see. It's like they've got so much cash and their stock is so cheap then they're just gonna basically eliminate as many shares as they can. And you're also seeing a lot of Dutch auctions these days where a company does a big, big buyback all at once, as opposed to over a year, they, they put out a notice and say, we're gonna buy X hundred million dollars worth of shares next month. And then shareholders either decide if they wanna do that or not. And generally not is the correct response because the company has just told you that A, their stock's cheap, Again, or at least they believe their stock is cheap, but they've also told you that they've got a couple of hundred million dollars just sitting around. <laughs> um, you know, take take a look at that, and when the good times return, if there's less shares outstanding, the per share leverage it you know becomes quite significant when you have thirty percent shares less than you had mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. The fourth factor is the company's debt maturity schedule, or in other words, when its various debts must be repaid. What trends might suggest underlying strength or weakness? Sure. So this kind of goes back to, is your company going to be around when the good times are back? Mm -hmm. And not all companies can be debt-free. And debt is not so bad. If you're a growing company, you can finance uh, many, many projects with debt without diluting shareholders. So you want to see a, a progression of debt where it's spread out over different maturities. Because if next year is worse, you don't want to have to come up with a ton of money to refinance. And financing windows close in 2008 in the financial crisis, one of the reasons that was so bad was investors and banks got scared and they didn't want to lend companies money. They were just too worried. And so you don't want to get into a situation where you've got all your debt maturing in one particular time period. You want it spread out over time. And that also protects you from interest rates as well. Uh, as your debt matures, you don't all have it coming in at 10 or 15% or whatever it might be down the road. It's just a more sort of diversified debt maturity schedule. And companies get themselves into trouble all the time because they expect they can finance and then the window of financing closes and they can't, financing, they can't finance at attractive terms. It changes their margins. It changes their uh, balance sheet risk. The banks are now in control of how much they're going to get and it's just a, a bad situation so just take a look at the debt maturity schedule and you want it spread out over time with no giant balloon payments that are going to get you in trouble okay let's shift back to our example company how ready do they look uh, to be able to handle a prolonged downturn based on its debt maturity schedule so it's a little bit tricky here because you've got a one to five year maturity range in 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 the first category but knowing the cash flow of the company and knowing what the company does um, it's not going to be an issue at all because you've got not a whole lot of debt versus what their cash flow is, and that's key. So I, I would prefer to see each year outlined in a company's notes where we know exactly how much debt is coming due next year and in the next year and the next year. But if you can't get that, you have to compare it to the cash flow, uh, any cash on hands, and any any assets that the company could possibly sell if they couldn't finance, and and not none of those are an issue here at all. Okay, with that being said, let's take another brief pause so I can dive back into WebBroker and demonstrate for the audience how they can find information that can help them assess a company's debt situation. We'll do that by choosing the Fundamentals tab here near the top of the page. 
And on this particular page, there's one quick piece of information that I'd like to show. If we can scroll down to uh, about two thirds of the way down the page, we can see that there's three uh, liability related pieces of information that can be quite useful. We have a debt to capital ratio, as well as a current and quick ratio. These are opportunities for us to get it to see how the company is positioned to handle uh, their short-term debt obligations with their short-term assets. Okay, to dive a little bit deeper into the company's liabilities, we'll scroll back to the top of the page and this time choose the financial statements selection. From here, we're going to choose the balance sheet and if we scroll down below the assets, there's a liabilities section. If we can expand that option, we now get that same five year overview of the company's liabilities and debt obligations. We get that bar chart for us to be able to see and do a quick trend analysis to, to ensure things are trending in the direction that we'd like to see. From here, we also do get the opportunity to see short term debt obligations as well as more longer term debt obligations over that same five-year period so we can ensure that those obligations are not growing beyond a, uh, a level that we're not comfortable with. One other very useful piece of information here from this particular page, if we scroll down further, and if we look and expand the shareholder equity portion, at the bottom of this table, we do get an opportunity to see a total number of common shares that are presently outstanding. Here we can see, is the company issuing more shares to raise more capital, or are they seeing value in their current market price and actually going and buying shares and taking shares out of circulation? So more useful information to help you make an informed decision. Okay, so the fifth factor is the sustainability of a company's dividend payout and, and growth, really. Uh, why might this be important to its prospects for a rebound in its stock price? Sure. So first off, dividends are very important to investors. They, they like dividends and they're willing to pay more for a company that pays dividend. They, they like to get that sort of regular stream of cash flow coming in from their investment. So it's important from a, from a stock ownership perspective, because if that dividend gets stopped or reduced or halted, then investors are not going to pay as much for that company anymore because they're, frankly, they're just disappointed. They're not getting the money anymore. So what you want to look at is, is how can that company pay its dividend? How can it continue to pay its dividend? Uh, what kind of cushion does it have versus a dividend? And what happens to that dividend if we go into a multi-year recession or a, or a big giant decline in the economy? And so you want a situation where there's basically you want some leeway. You want a, a cushion for the company where they're not paying out all their cash flow as, in, as dividends. They're not paying out all their income as dividends. And you also, you also like that for another reason. And that's because if a company has a cushion on its dividend, it can increase its dividend. And of course, investors love it when they get a, a, a free raise. They haven't done anything and they get more money. That's like I, I, I sometimes I teach to um, students and I say like a dividend increase is the best job you could ever possibly have because you've done nothing and now you have more money. Like who, who doesn't want that? <laughs> um, and so that's great for evaluations of companies as well. So, but you, you don't want a, a dividend that's going to be halted next month and you don't want a dividend that is in jeopardy if we go into recession. So it's, it's careful. You know, one thing to look at is where, what cushion do you have as a company? So Peter, how sustainable might the example company's dividend payout be in a shaky economy? So generally, generally anything above 50% requires in, in our world more scrutiny. Um, so if a company is above 50% payout ratio, then you have to look at how steady is the cash flow? What's their balance sheet like? Are they in a cyclical business or not? Um, you know, what sort of swings can they, you know, have they always made money or sometimes do they lose money? And so, you know, looking at the examples, no one's in real, real big trouble, but obviously the, the, the companies in the low teens are in much better shape than the, than the other two companies. So nothing to worry about, but it would require more due diligence and say, okay, if you've got a, a ratio that's pushing 50%, you know, why is that? And how, you know, how risky is that if things get worse? Um, and again, some companies, like if you're a utility company or a telephone company, their cash flows are extremely steady. No one gives up their phone in a recession because as they say, you need your phone to look for a job. Um, but again, you have to look, dig down and see what the company is doing and what sort of risk you've got if you own a dividend payout ratio that's 60 or 70%. You really have to do your homework there. Um, because we have, we have a, a rule at 5i Research which says 
the first dividend cut is not the last. And so generally a company will cut a dividend and then they'll eliminate it. And you get a chance to get out at the, you know, if you happen to own that company, you get a chance to get out on the first cut before your dividend goes to zero. And we, we don't like those scenarios and try and avoid them at all costs. That's, that's fair. And uh, nobody gives up their phone willingness, willingly, uh, regardless if it's a recession or not, just uh, ask my right. children. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right, let's jump back into WebBroker one last time to see how investors can help size up a company's dividend sustainability. First of all, for this particular company, if we'd like to find out when the next payment is from the overview page, if we just scroll down on the page, on the right hand side, we get to see the dividend yield. This is a percentage that the dividend makes up of the underlying shares price. We get to see how much that annual dividend is, as well as the ex-dividend date, as well as the payment date. So we're kept informed on that important piece of information. Alternatively, we also can scroll to the top of the page, and this time under the events tab near the top of the page, third from the right, if we choose that option, this gets us into a calendar of events for this particular company. There is a dividend selection. Here, we get to track and see all of the historical dividend payments over the recent number of years the company has made. So we can see the dates at which those payments were made and we get to see a bird's eye view of the dividend amount during that period. So we hopefully can see as this is demonstrating, this company's paid an ever increasing dividend per share so that we know that they are committed to keeping that dividend in place. Next, if we'd like to see how our company's dividend stacks up to its industry peers, where we'll go for, to find that information is under the Fundamentals tab. From here, we'll select the Peer Comparison submenu. Now we get to see how this particular company stacks up to not only the industry average, but to its closest competitors. Scroll down and then under the annual dividend information, we can see how our company is doing once again to its peers in its industry to ensure that we're getting the most bang for our buck if we are after uh, dividends in this particular case. Thank you so much for sharing some of the factors you seek out to find undervalued stocks during market downturns, Peter. We really appreciate you taking the time. You've given us plenty of food for thought uh, to help us in our research. Do you have any, uh, any closing thoughts? Sure. I mean, it's a tough market, um, but I've seen about 30 bear markets, it seems like. Um, the, the bear market will end. Um, so just sort of remind yourself that you're buying a business. You're not buying the market. And um, this is not the first crisis and it won't be the last. If it's not the last first bear market. It won't be the last. And uh, just put in your time. Don't don't be a hero. <laughs> yeah, that silver bullet is what everybody's yeah. after. But no, it's a great way to great way to sum it up. And for those in our audience, make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content available in the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.